Well, good morning. The irony of it all is that when I was 13, this funny guy from Omaha used to start showing up in our house. No one had ever heard of him back then. He would talk to me about value investing. He would talk to me about, you know, his teacher, Ben Graham, had said that, had taught him how in the short run the market is a voting machine, in the long run it's a weighing machine, it's a scale. And that's my worldview. And you may not know it, but I used to be in your seats. I used to work. I, I was completely brought up in the value tradition. It's so imprinted on me I can't see anything else. I used to work for Sandy Gottesman at First Manhattan, a great value investor and friend of that guy from Omaha's. <coughs> um, so how odd it may seem that I'm in this fight with Wall Street, of which you may have heard, that seems at least superficially to be about stock prices, because why do value investors care? Well, I'm going to explain how I reconcile uh, that those two points. But first, I thought I would address the elephant in the room and tell you a quick story. Last year, I was in town, and I was seeing a, a very well-known hedge fund boss, good guy, kind of a, a uh, elder statesman in that field. And he sat down with me. I've known him at a distance for years. He sat down and he said, Patrick, there's something uh, I want to tell you. You've become the most hated man I've ever known in my entire life. In this town, you couldn't be more despised. You could kill people and you wouldn't be hated like you're hated in this town. Later, <laughs> later that day, I uh, uh, I was over at a different hedge fund. I'll tell you the name of this one. It was Perry Capital. And a guy came up to me, not Richard Perry, but somebody who works for him, came up. God never met in this case. Just came up and got in my face and said, you son of a bitch. Who do you think you are? I'm so insulted. How could you possibly blah, 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 blah. Well, I told them both what I'll tell you. I think there's a massive financial crime occurring against America, occurring against retail investors and people like you. If you're not one of the cheaters, and I do think there are some cheaters in this room, you're likely to be one of the cheaties. So what I would like to respectfully propose uh, you consider is this is reality. This is me holding a Peruvian teapot made uh, by, we have a store at Overstock, a store called Worldstock, which sells products from disadvantaged and handicapped artisans around the world. So this is reality. Take a close look. This is reality on the New York Post. Watch the teapot. That's, that's Darth Maul. And that's not real, and it's not currently available at Overstock. And my point is not that, I mean, we all know, I think, in this room that about the New York Post. It's for folks who move their lips when they read People magazine. But what I, <laughs> what I want to pro propose that you consider is what you know about me and this fight I'm in, or what you think you know, is based on information that has gone through the same filter as this reality. And that filter is a filter called the New York financial media. So life is long, and we'll have plenty of time to fight each other, and, and you'll have plenty of time to hate me. But I propose for the next 38 minutes, let's just set that aside, and uh, Let's just set that aside. I'm going, to, I'm going to ask a central question. How do you get people to, to consider the possibility that their reality, that their paradigm is completely flawed? Well, the classic way to do it is to ask the right question, and I'm going to start by asking you a question. Here is the Department of Justice's indictment against Milberg Weiss, and this is a page 10 out of it. And it talks about how Milberg Weiss hired individuals basically to act as plaintiffs. Uh, and from page 29, the paid plaintiffs purchased securities this year, anticipating the securities would decline in value in order to position themselves to be named plaintiffs and to obtain kickbacks from Milberg Weiss. What's odd about that? What doesn't fit into the paradigm, the classic paradigm that sort of we all have been brought up in? What's odd? The paid plaintiffs purchased the securities at issue, anticipating that the securities would decline. How did they know? How did Milberg Weiss, were the, are, is Milberg Weiss and Bill Rock, are they great, are they great investors that they, are they hedge fund people who can tell 
when a security is overvalued? Is that how they knew? Isn't that odd? Now, interesting, I haven't seen a single article or journalist who has picked up on that. How did Milberg Weiss know the securities were going to decline? They didn't just buy shares across the board. They bought them in specific companies that they knew were going to decline. How did they know? Well, I'm going to tell you how they knew. It's a rabbit hole. I feel like Morpheus in Matrix when Morpheus said, look, I'm going to, you can take the red pill or the blue pill. You take the blue pill, you'll wake up in bed, you believe anything you want to believe. But if I, you take the red pill, I'll show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Well, I'm going to start with some public choice theory and then explain the social outcome of that. Then I'm going to explain a crime that is going on. Crime has three effects, a small, medium, and possibly a large uh, effect. I'm going to explain the role of the financial press and the cover-up. I suspect this, this may, I once did a call two years ago called the Miscreants Ball, of which I was and remain very proud. I hope this uh, achieves the same status. Some public choice theory. I'm going to begin by talking about sugar. The United States, if you don't know it, our retail price of sugar is about 43 cents a pound. The world price is 23 cents a pound. The difference of 20 cents a pound, it costs if you just, each of us, we consume about 60 pounds a year, so it costs each of us 12 bucks times 300 million Americans. It's $3.6 billion. It costs American consumers. It generates about $1.7 billion extra wholesale for sugar producers. So it's a net loss to society of $2 billion. Why do we have this? Why do we keep a quota that keeps $2 billion, that costs society $2 billion? Because of Congress. Ask yourself, who, whom does the quota cost? Uh, well, it costs, I depict them as grandmas, it uh, costs 300 million people who as a group are not self-aware, not organized. They don't lobby to save themselves $12. Uh, whom does it benefit? Benefits about two dozen corporations. About 50% of the benefit goes to about three of them. And they are self-aware, and they are politically organized, and they do lobby. And in this situation, a political mechanism will deflect. It creates a quota, which is basically an economic pump siphoning $3.6 billion out. $1.7 billion is delivered to the, the, these folks. There's a term for this among economists. It's called the problem of dispersed costs and concentrated benefits. And I'm going to suggest that our current regulatory regime is a classic case of this. And in particular in that downward stock manipulation creates a dispersed set of costs, concentrated set of benefits, allowing stocks to return to their intrinsic value or, or God forbid, a squeeze. That creates a dispersed set of benefits and a concentrated set of costs. So it's – and by the way, this applies to Republicans, Democrats, social it, – it happens in every economy. It's a classic problem of political mechanisms that they, they veer towards – uh, outcomes of dispersed costs and concentrated benefits, what that creates is something called regulatory capture. The classic case of regulatory capture is the ICC, the, the Interstate Commerce Commission, the world's first regulator, formed in the 1870s, regulated the railroads and later the trucking industry, the exact same dynamic. Everybody learned that if you were a good boy and you regulated lightly, by restricting new entrants into your industry, setting tariffs, rates, prices artificially high, so all the firms in the industry made mega profits, that there would be, you could join the regulatory agency, you could work there 10 to 20 years, retire, and there'd be a very comfy job for you on the board of directors or in one of the companies you've been regulating. Well, presumably that sounds a little familiar at this point. Uh, the ICC, they, the exact same thing happened in the 1930s when they took over the trucking industry. There's a, there's a law professor at Harvard named John Hansen. He's introduced this concept called deep capture, that maybe it isn't just this regulator or that regulator who's captured, but that the whole system is captured. The regulators, the congressional oversight, the press, the economists. Is it possible the, law, the courts, could the whole thing be captured? Now, he just dreamed up this term as kind of a far-out theory. 
Well, you just heard from Gary Aguirre, who incidentally is one of my personal heroes, and I think he's just a great American, as corny as that sounds, but he is a hero. And, uh, of course, for that, he'll be pilloried and such forever. Uh, I'm not, since he just walked through this, I won't go into great detail. He wrote, he was an SEC whistleblower, and he wrote a letter saying, is the SEC protecting the capital markets? No. Uh, I'm just going to go through quickly, because you just heard from him. It's no, they haven't gone after any hedge funds for a quarter of a century. They didn't do anything about the mutual fund scandal. Uh, he talks about the systemic risk. Uh, and there's growing evidence that today's pools, hedge funds, have advanced and refined the practice of manipulating and cheating other market participants. That largely means you. Again, that means most of the people in the room, the non-cheaters. Of course, he was pilloried and met with derision from all the usual suspects. The Senate investigated, said, again, he was right about all of this. You just heard from the Senate confirmed, yes, he was told that you couldn't go after these elites because in one case he had juice, that the political connections were too strong, they were too powerful. This is all corroborated by internal SEC emails, um, including one from a supervisor who was negotiating for a job with a law firm who was defending the guy who wanted to go after it on the same day. Um, again, it was all just political clout, political capture. In particular, the report ends, it's a fascinating report, it ends excoriating the Inspector General of the SEC. Uh, now, something that has not been written on, but this report came out, I think, on August 3rd, within a week, plus or minus, on each side of its release, you know, the SEC has really seven people at the top, five commissioners, an inspector general, and chief economist. Within a week, four of them were gone. The inspector general had held the post since 1989. One report says he was the first. I haven't some, I'm not sure that's true, but he, he at least had been there since 1989. The chief economist resigned. Two of the four commission, uh, non-chairman commissioners resigned. So four out of seven, including Cox, were gone what would we say of a company where four out of seven top executives were gone in the space of a fortnight? <clears throat> this is basically a regulatory Enron occurring under our noses that, of course, well, very few, the New York financial media will not write about. So the outcome is regulatory capture. Because the regulators are captured by some criminals, uh, they're turning a blind eye to some illegal behavior. Uh, this is the illegal behavior. I'm going to uh, go through. Just imagine two participants, one I've depicted as a guy with a desk, meaning more of a professional ver versus a grandma investor. And, of course, we all know that we don't really talk to each other when we buy and sell stock. We have broker-dealers. The broker-dealers are arranged around a central clearing organization called the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation, which also importantly acts as a counterparty risk. So you don't always have to understand your counterparty risk with strangers. They, they act as a central counterparty risk uh, taker. Well, when we buy and sell stock, the clearing and settlement occurs three days later within the DTCC over 80% of the time. There's a small batch that occurs external or is moved external to the DTCC, broadly called X-clearing. Now imagine a, a guy shows up and there's a loophole in the rules. And I, I, I really thought, every, I kind of assumed that everybody knew about this stuff, but I was told, no, I should really break it down. There's a loophole in the regulations since this was set up and the way that this was set up that says if the, if the time comes to deliver stock that you sold and you don't have the stock, the system basically, you don't want the whole system to grind to a halt. If somebody forgot to sign the right form or if somebody, you know, somebody's dog ate their certificate or something. So the system creates a marker, creates an IOU, a, a failure to deliver, and that is sort of a temporary marker to go out into the system until you clean up whatever the paperwork problem is, well, it's my thesis that people have figured out, certain people have figured out how they can abuse that, that loophole and flood the market with what uh, often in connivance with a broker-dealer. And there's already lawsuits springing up now between these guys, and it's going to be quite an interesting legal question 
who has the risk? Oh, he gave, I mean, who really, you know, where is the malfeasance? He gave me a good locate. He said, a, you know, it's going to go back and forth. But two people perhaps or uh, two agents working together start flooding the market with these failures to deliver. Now, this has become known by, as a broad class, the name naked short selling. I don't like that term. And I don't like the term for two reasons. One is there's a bunch of different ways this, these show up in the marketplace. One of the ways is naked short selling. One's abuse of the option market maker exemption. There's unsettled offshore trades, which are called failure to receives. There's stuff is moved X clearing, and then it gets a different name. And there's all this different terminology. So naked short selling is really just one. There's, un, there's unsettled long sales, which may be a multiple of the unsettled short sales. No, uh, so I don't like negative short selling because it's not really comprehensive enough and also because it creates an opportunity for the people who are doing this to come back and say, oh, no, no, there's nothing wrong with short selling. Short selling is good. Short selling is – well, short selling is good. Short selling is fine. It injects information into the market. The fight has never been about short selling, notwithstanding the chatter in the financial media. The fight's not about short selling. You know, if somebody were up talking about sexual harassment and somebody came back and said, no, 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 sex is good, sex is fine, everything's good, you'd say, wait a second, sexual harassment is not about sex. Naked short selling isn't about short selling. A sea lion is not a type of lion. Naked short selling is, a, is it's just not about shorting, really. It's about these unsettled trades accumulating in the system. I've gotten a little tired of saying things that I think are chimp obvious and everybody's saying, oh, wacky, wacky, wacky. So you're going to see a bunch of clips of other people saying these obvious things. So it's going to, so here's Chairman Cox and his comments on it. And intentionally failing to deliver that stock within the standard three day settlement period can be market manipulation that is clearly violative of the federal securities law. Okay. You know, who knew? Who knew that selling things that don't exist and taking people's money for it and not delivering anything is violative of the law? Who knew? Shapiro is a guy I've been working with. He's former, he's a Harvard economist. He would counsel economic advisors under Clinton, Secretary of Commerce for Economics. Again, a guy, it's kind of hard to say, oh, this is all just made up in Patrick Byrne's head. There is significant transparency with a uh, with respect to long sales, regular sales, yeah. um, we know how many sales there are of every stock. Um, but uh, when it comes to the delivery of shares, which is uh, where we know there are hundreds of millions of shares that are sold and yeah. not delivered, but most of those are short sales. All of the specifics of that are kept secret. And so there's this great asymmetry between long activity and short activity, especially FTD activity. And it's been very difficult to find out how much of this is going on, how deep a problem it is. Well, using the Freedom of Information Act request, we got, we finally got, this is the number of failures there were in the system and companies that were on the reg show list since the reg show came into effect at the beginning of 05, reg show being the SEC's tepid attempt to do something. I'd say almost a mock attempt to do something about this. Well, this SEC economist Chester Spat, who ran the Office of Economic Analysis, who I understand was supposed to be here. I hope he's here. Is he here? He came out last summer and said with a regulation that's basically, I mean, a, a memo, public memo that said Reg Show is working. And when, or I gave it away, when did he say this? When did he say Reg Show was working? Did he say it on in eliminating the fails. Did he say it as they started to come down or did he say it at the bottom? Well, actually, no. He said this there. That's when he said that Reg Show was working. And he did it by saying, well, if we compare this point with the average of the point over the last six months, and that's, you know, the average of the point on the backside is lower than it was here, and then it, say it went down. So he looked at this and he said Reg Show was cleaning up the level of fails. He was lying. Uh, okay, the effects of this. There's three effects, a small, medium, and a large. The small problem is this. If you haven't heard, corporate democracy is completely corrupted at this point. Here's another non-wacky magazine called Bloomberg Markets, Sears Journal. This appeared last year, the corporate voting charade. 
article by Bob Drummond. It says a robust market for stock loans puts into circulation billions of borrowed shares that create multiple votes that corrupt corporate elections. In closed contests, a little room for error, the results of high-stakes company decisions may hinge on the invisible influence of millions of votes that shouldn't be counted. Now, this, came, this quote came from a, the CEO of a registrar and transfer company, Thomas Montrone. So this is the backroom guy who is counting your votes. These are the guys who are counting your votes when you vote. And he says, it's an abomination. A lot of the time we have no idea who's entitled to vote and who isn't. It's nothing short of criminal. Uh, there are votes cast twice on almost every matter of substance. It definitely can and, in my experience, does affect the outcome of corporate elections. In fact, Bloomberg did an analysis, 400 elections in 2005. They discovered where the margin of error in – I'm sorry, the margin of victory in the election was smaller than the number of excess votes that had to be thrown out, which means those 400 corporate decisions really got made not by the shareholders but by some kid in the back office – who was learning, who, you know, was based on which sack of votes he threw out. And, uh, in fact, there were the New York Stock Exchange, I don't think they say it was the NYC, but it was, they looked at 341 companies on NICE in 2005, found overvoting in all 341. So the truth is, in, a, in the best of all possible worlds, it would be a kid in the back office throwing out the votes, but the truth is, arbitrageurs have learned how to game the system. And, in fact, just on Tuesday, Eric Siri, the head of market regulation, was speaking here in New York. And this basically says this is going to become a big issue for us in 2008. This has become, it goes without saying how critical these issues are. Uh, the commission will be facing over the coming year. It basically says we, we got to get our arms on this. What's interesting is there was a professor from Texas named Professor Hu who also spoke, and he dissected a case where the hedge fund had gone and they had owned a stake in an acquired, and a company was to be acquired, and they went out and bought 10% of the acquiree and used a derivative or something to shear off their economic assets, but just so they could vote the stock. So guess which hedge fund that was? It was Perry Capital. It was the one where the guy had come up and gotten in my face and said, you son of a bitch, how could, we, how could you possibly think that blah, 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 blah. How How funny. <laughs> Medium problem is medium problem is companies are killed. Now again, I, I feel silly showing you this because I think it's it's all got to be super basic to you. But obviously, you recognize price, quantity, supply and demand curves, and picture a stock a company. Let's say they cross at forty dollars. Somebody shows up and starts selling these FTDs into the market. Well, what's he doing? He's increasing supply. He's moving the supply line to the right. So watch where supply and demand cross. Well, as he does this more and more, the supply line is going to keep shifting to the right and where supply and demand meet is going to drop. There are some companies where the number of FTDs in the marketplace are a significant fraction of and conceivably even in some cases a multiple of the number of actual shares. But what that does is look where supply and demand cross. Of course, the price is going to collapse. And could become a $30 stock, could become a penny stock. If it's a penny stock, demand dries up, a ceiling forms over the stock. The FTDs become, they're basically stock IOUs. They become penny IOUs. The, the firm's a penny stock. A death spiral ensues because customers shun the firm, and depending on the type of firm. Capital markets shun the firm. Firm can't recover. Of course, can't raise money even in pipes, products, and technologies. And you all understand, I won't go into the dynamics really, but the, the, the perfect victims for this are tech companies, biotech companies, and small financial companies. The, they're the ideal victims for a bunch of reasons, primarily because it's easiest to create the most doubt in the public about them if you have some captured journalists who are willing to shill for you. Uh, shareholder values destroyed, jobs are disappeared. Basically, society is screwed in particular because the guy doing this gets to keep his cash and not pay tax until or unless the firm goes bankrupt. And even then, this whole system of reporting and paying tax on that is apparently quite, uh, well, it's broken. Of this, uh, now, Shapiro has said, this is Bloomberg again. Former Undersecretary of Commerce Robert Shapiro works as a consultant for lawyers representing alleged victims of naked short sellers. 
He says as many as a thousand public companies were damaged by naked shorting in the decade it took to get Reg Show into the rule books. A lot of those companies are gone. A lot of them died. Uh, this was a, a fatal, uh, fatal attack. Now, some of them were weak when they were attacked. Some of them would have failed anyway. Others wouldn't have. Again, it's not up to the naked short sellers to decide. Um, it's up to the investors that play by the rules. Again, I just put that up. It's like, who knew? I mean, I've been in this public fight with people who are making the most ridiculous position, taking the most ridiculous position. You can't go into a hospital, into a pneumonia ward, smother a bunch of people, and then say, oh, well, they probably would have died anyway. Who really knows who would have died? No, you can't, you can't do that. You can't sell things that don't exist. You can't manipulate stocks. Some of these companies would have died. Some of them are no good. Some of them are crooks. Some of them are just little biotech professors trying to develop something. It's up to the marketplace to decide, not up to people who counterfeit stock. <laughs> uh, the, the big problem, and I admit this is only a possible problem, is the, cons the possibility of systemic risk. And by that, I mean, if this stuff were ever forced to be cleaned up, what would happen? Well, you understand the dynamics of a short squeeze, and which might make it take more money to clean up than was drained out anyway. In any case, a lot of the money might not be in the system anymore. It may have turned into ha mansions in the Hamptons. So if, you, if this person were ever forced to clean up, to buy in his, DTs, his uh, FTDs, he might run out of money before he runs out of FTDs to clean up, in which case... He's, he vapor locks. Well, his, his prime broker could, this could ripple through the system in a way I think, you know, two years ago, people laughed at me when I said this. I think people are getting that this isn't such a joke. It could ripple through the system. And in fact, the DTCC took steps two years ago that such that if in the case of such an, of a rippling effect, its counterparty risk sort of goes away and it, it goes back to saying, well, that's between you, Lehman, and you, JP Morgan, or something, which of course, obviates the whole point of having a central clearing organization. And it's not such a silly possibility that the SEC, and this is off the SEC website, when they passed Regulation Show, which again was quite tepid, but they grandfathered all of the fails that were in the system. Why? Well, they explain on their website. The grandfathering, the grandfathering provisions of Regulation Show were adopted because the SEC was concerned about creating volatility where there were large pre-existing open positions. Now, why is that strange? That's strange because a, just a year previously, they were denying this existed. They were denying this is, was any sort of a problem. So the SEC, on the, out of one side of their mouth, has been saying, you know, here's Annette Nazareth saying, oh, anybody talking about this, they just want their stock to go up and stuff, wacky, 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 nothing to it. DTC spokesman doing the same thing. On the other side of the mouth, when they're forced to clean, to do something about this and to close, to tighten the loophole a little bit, they have to, they say the grandfathering provisions were adopted because they were afraid of creating volatility from the large pre-existing open positions that a year previously they were denying existed. That's odd. And in fact, they even said that they couldn't disclose the information because the fa this is right off the SEC website. The fail statistics of individual firms and customers is proprietary and may reflect firms' trading strategies. Now, there's a missing word in that sentence. Any? Bueller? What's the missing word? The missing word's illegal. We can't, the failed statistics of individual firms and customers is proprietary information and may reflect those firms' illegal trading strategies. So it's not happening. There are no large batches of FTDs built up in the system, and anyone who says otherwise is just a paranoid and he's mad his stock went down. On the other hand, those large batches that don't exist, we have to grandfather them, and we can't disclose their size. Otherwise, the volatility would disrupt the capital markets and reveal the strategies of the people who've been doing the illegal, tra practicing illegal trading strategies. So they call me wacky, but, the, you know, you ask me, Nurse Ratchet, you're the one who's crazy. <laughs> okay. Uh, the possible large problem, systemic risk. So now we get to the role of the financial press and the cover-up. Uh, the, the financial press. Yeah. My claim about the financial press, rather than me make it, I'm going to let this guy make it. 
When your company's in a survival mode, it's really important to defeat research in motion and get the Pisanis of the world and the people talking about it as if there's something wrong with RIM. Then you would call the journal and you get the Bozo reporter on research in motion and you would feed that there's a Palm's got a killer it's going to give away. These are all the things you must do on a day like today. And if you're not doing it, maybe you shouldn't be in the game. See, that's all I was saying. I'm saying that a relationship exists among some hedge funds and some financial reporters that's exactly as he describes. That's all I've been saying. Well, might as well go further. These illegal trades, uh, legal naked short trades, it's hard to do them. It may be possible to do them without leaving a fingerprint in the market, but at least some ways of doing it do leave a thim- thumbprint or a, a footprint, I'd say, in the market. It's very difficult to find. You need, very, you need a very good economist and statistical analyst, such as I have here in the room, who's been doing this. And he's got to sort through mountains of data and tie things together. And you can find these footprints. And what's interesting is you can find these footprints often on the Chicago Exchange. It's very complicated. I won't go into the dynamics, but I'm going to talk about the footprints. And let's, I want to talk about the timing of the footprints with some other events. I picked, uh, here's a bunch of companies that are heavily shorted, been on the reg show list, you know, for months or years in most cases. Uh, total number of days on the ratio list on the right. And I here are the hedge funds who have been publicly out there saying they're short them. There's green light, there's SAC, there's rocker, there's rocker and SAC, there's third point, there's rocker. Uh, here are the spikes of the first and second largest spike of this activity. Now, of course, I can't say I should, that these hedge funds are the ones doing it, by the way. But I'm, I, we have gone through the data and we found where are the first and second largest spikes And then we've said, when did the Milberg Weiss lawsuit come in? When did the SEC inquiry come in and get disclosed and any other significant legal events? And what you find is this very strange pattern. Here's a spike seven days before the Milberg Weiss lawsuit was filed. And here's something within a day of each other. And here's a day. And here's a a day. And here's six days before. And here's the same day. And here's uh, 13 days before. It goes on and on. Here's, here's uh, suits coming in from the SEC, uh, no, uh, the spike in Chicago four days before the suits coming in from the SEC. How, and it goes on and on. What also is interesting, and this is really going to be the work for some media critic at some point, is on the far right, the, the stories that have been written about these companies by Herb Greenberg, Roddy Boyd, Carol Rabone, Bethany McLean, every single one, in many cases, multiple, multiple, multiple stories on this set, this set of companies. <clears throat> and in fact, so could it be coordinated? Well, we don't really have to guess at this point. There's a, there's a firm in, in uh, Arizona called Gradient. There's now about half a dozen employees who have left giving sworn statements that say, yeah, there's absolute coordination. One says, I, hear, I heard many hedge funds request that Gradient re- delay the release of reports from three to seven days to allow them to take a position in their stocks. Uh, in particular, it appeared to me that Rocker, Vickery, and Herb Greenberg were coordinating their tax. Vickery and Greenberg were coordinating the content and timing of their various reports to please Rocker. Uh, so, and by the way, this isn't just one guy. This is half a dozen people. And three of them went to their boss and said, this is illegal. What we're getting, what we're doing here is illegal. A couple days later, he was fu- they were fired. And, of course, Roddy and Carol and people come out and say, well, you can't trust them. They were fired. Well, they were whistleblowers. They got fired. One of them, you know, there's others there who work there who say exactly the same stories. This is Here's something interesting. This is an employee timesheet from Gradient Analytics. I've crossed out whose it is. But this is the category of how they can track their work. And they can take vacations. They can do holiday, sick pay, personal days, research, office management, or Milberg Weiss. I'll blow that up for you. Milberg Weiss, that's like one of the main categories of that where you track your work there. So you can be in research, you can be in sales, or you can do stuff for Milberg Weiss. So here's an article by Bethany McLean from Fortune, which happened to occur. I wish I had used it. When I did my miscreants ball call, I flew back to, San, to Utah, and on the flight I picked up the fortune. Here's an article by Bethany McLean on Take Two. It's got exactly three sources in it, three sources, Don Vickery of Gradient, David Rocker, 
and his partner, Mark Cahodes. That's like doing an article on does Iraq have WMD and talking to just Ahmed Chalabi and Don Rumsfeld. Oh, that's Judy Miller, sorry. So my point is that's how they knew. They did knew. That's how they knew. That's why they anticipated that certain securities would decline. There is, in short, a closed circle of corruption. The closed circle of corruption includes a small pack of hedge funds, a group of journalists, a, uh, a research shop, perhaps some players at the SEC, who are tipping off exactly when these lawsuits are going to come in, and a law firm called Milberg Weiss. Uh, and I'm not saying that everybody's on the take. I think that some of the journalists are on the take. I think some of them are not. I think that some of them are just conformist. Uh, a friend of mine who analyzed this, put it, a, a media critic, uh, had a great line for it. They tried to become players, but they became pawns. That's how... and. At the end of the day, the money being made out of this is coming from somebody's pocket, and I believe it's coming from your, po your pockets, and if you're not in on it, and it's coming from the pockets of millions of Americans. There's one word you haven't heard yet. One word you may have expected to hear, but you haven't heard. Overstock. See, this is not about overstock, and it's not about Patrick Byrne, it's not about Sith Lords. I think that something is dramatically wrong unprecedented in our lifetime, in our marketplace. This isn't about us. But the cover-up became to try to make it something, well, let me go to Dan Colarusso. Now, Dan Colarusso was caught on tape, and he's furious that I have this tape. Dan Colarusso was at the time the business editor of the New York Post. Here he was talking to Herb Greenberg, New York Times, Jonas Serra, Dave Kansas, in a small panel. Uh, I couldn't find out if Carol who's in the back of the room, Carol Ramon, was, was here or not. But just listen. This is the journalistic integrity. Uh, when I think about Patrick Byrne, I mean, you know, we have barrels of ink and stacks of money and all the resources in the world at our disposal, uh, legal um, and in, via our, you know, our media, to crush them. So that's the paragon of journalist in integrity that is Dan Calaruso. Then the next part of the cover-up is, ah, this is all a uh, distraction. This is, you know, is this, has this been a good distraction? Have I really distracted people? <laughs> so this was all a big distraction. And, and they became the conspiracy theorists, oddly enough. But what's really going on is there's a conspiracy. There's another conspiracy. There is a cons the real conspiracy, if there's a conspiracy, is a conspiracy by these people to try to silence the critics. Oh, this one I love. This one, David Kansas has basically been a lifetime. Yeah, well, anyway, Dave Kansas and Jim Cramer are like this. Dave Kansas, big shot editor of the Wall Street Journal at the time, basically made it his life's goal. Anyway, he sent over Karen Richardson in a leotard to my hotel room. I don't, it's a different story. But, <laughs> so Karen, and I refused to cooperate in any way, including, uh, she wanted, she wanted access to my medical records, and I said, look, you're absolutely nuts. I have a tape recording, which she knows, of me saying I will not cooperate. I've got emails. She went to my hospital. For those of you, I was sick. I had cancer. I was in the hospital for a few years. She went and tried, and she lied, and she tried to get my medical records for some weird reason. Here's a letter from the hospital administrator. Basically, they went berserk. When I told them, absolutely, I'm not cooperating, this is just about how this woman called up and try to convince them that I had given permission, so on and so forth, to turn over my medical records. Uh, this is a felony. This is a felony. So here's Jim Cramer, you know, in 2002, talking about David Rocker, who was on a show, and in fact, we have a news clip, I couldn't load it, of Jim Cramer introducing his friend David Rocker, and they are old friends. Jim Cramer married, married a woman who worked at Michael Steinhardt's, with David Rocker was the protege of Michael Steinhardt. It's a long story. Uh, here he is coming on our conference call saying, I've never met David Rocker. Well, yeah, I met him once in a supermarket. You know, these guys are old friends, but it's tr if you're willing to just come out and lie through your teeth and lie and lie. You may remember a year and a half ago, well, I got a, I got a, I became the target of, well, I don't know exactly, but I got a SEC subpoena and I immediately came out and I put out a press release saying, I'm the first CEO in history to celebrate receiving an SEC subpoena. 
I even went on the radio and talked about, I'll meet the SEC in any courtroom in the land, and I will put them on trial. This is a disgrace, and it's disgraceful that I'm having to clean this up. So about a month ago, these guys started writing stories saying, well, we've uncovered that Patrick Byrne has got a subpoena, and he's tried to hide this, all this. I mean, it's crazy. It's Oh, here's a great story. Columbia Journalism Review, for those who don't know. Should I stop here, Brent? I've got about two more slots. Thanks. <laughs> Columbia Journalism Review, for those who don't know, it's basically the gold standard of journalism. They give the Pulitzer, the School of Journalism gives the Pulitzer Prize. Well, they got very interested in this at the beginning of last year. It called me and said, we haven't seen anything like this in this since the 19th century. What is, uh, what is going on? And I said, look, this is a pretty wild story. I'm just going to give you a couple of tidbits and you do the research because it's really a rabbit hole. The guy went and started doing research into various hedge funds and the relationship between these hedge funds and these pseudo-journalists. He wrote me a letter. But, well, six weeks later, he made his first call regarding a hedge fund. I'm not going to tell you the name of this well-known fellow. I'm call, I, he's Z in this email. He wrote me this. He, on, he went in on, on a Thursday. He started making calls about a specific person that you would all recognize his name. You all know his name, I promise. Uh, he, on a Thursday afternoon, after being in the story for six weeks, he made his first call using this guy's name. On Friday, he, uh, I finished work late. Now, this is him writing to me. Finished work late, going to a nearby dive bar. Three well-dressed guys, Armani-like clothes, hair gel, walk in and sit next to me. What do you, now, this is up 120th Street by Columbia, so not the normal. He says, they say, what are you reading? He says, a book on Wall Street. Oh, yeah, says, says Armani. Anything about this fellow in there? I say, yeah, he's mentioned. Armani laughs and says he used to work for the guy. He's a real jerk. He thinks he's got so much money he can do anything he wants. Hell, he's probably killed people for all I know. Then he tells a bizarre and totally convoluted story about how some guy from Saks Fifth Avenue murdered a customer because the customer went in the ladies' changing room and tried to watch the guy's wife get undressed. And, you know, the guy's a pervert. There's some things you don't do, some things you keep your nose out of. I would have killed the guy, too. Then he says they have to go. I ask for his name. He says it's John, John from Saks. They're out the door. Talk about the rabbit hole. Well, this guy continued for about six months his research against an amount of pressure that was what they said the CGR, unlike anything they'd ever seen. The Wall Street Journal sent lawyers, Dow Jones, Reuters sent lawyers threatening Columbia Journalism Review, and a personal disappointment to me, a very well-known editor of a major magazine, a person I considered a lifelong friend, actually called Columbia University to ask for the administration to put a stop to this story. Uh, this went on until finally uh, some people got up in his face in a bookstore and said, we're going to kill your child if you run this story. The same day that happened, he called me to say a large hedge fund had come into the Columbia Journalism Review and offered a large donation in return for this story never running. Now, he wouldn't tell me the name of the hedge fund, but he left. When they came and said, we're going to kill your four-year-old, he left. And with him gone, there was no way the CGR could write the story anyway. But you couldn't help but notice shortly thereafter, a, uh, the Columbia Journalism Review website had a new position called the Kingsford Capital Fellow. So I'm going to return to this concept I mentioned up front, deep capture. I believe our whole system is captured. It's been captured by a group of criminal hedge funds. It's about a dozen, less than that. If I asked for the, if I, if I asked you to write down the names, I bet there'd be 90% overlap. If I asked you to write down your six most likely candidates, there'd be 90% overlap. We all know who they are. I, uh, I think they've captured the regulators. The regulators now leave and go to work for these guys. They've captured uh, not all the journalists, but enough journalists who have become basically it's either they're shills or these guys, or there's just this amazing synchronicity between these spikes in the illegal trading and the stories that come out and the SEC lawsuits and the Milbert Weiss lawsuits. You can read more about this. I've created a blog called deepcaptured.com. You can also read about this on another thing called antisocialmedia.net. Now, I don't have time to explain this last line, but you're going to be hearing about this because there's a lot of reporters calling us. So just remember, you heard it here first, slim virgin equals Linda Mack. 
Okay, so back to reality. Which reality is yours? I can I can I can only give you the red pill and the blue pill. I can tell you this: Gandhi famously said of all social movements, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. Good luck with all your trades. <laughs>